Hello, welcome back. This is the fifth and final part in our discussion of motifs and motif discovery for bioinformatics. The slides are now available on Google Drive. Let's refresh our memory, what we're trying to do here. We've talked a lot about entropy, information calculation, or information content, and the like. What is it all for? In bioinformatics, we use this information, we use these calculations to try to predict or identify sequence motifs in particular. So this goes all the way back to why we want multiple sequence alignments, why it's important to have a good multiple sequence alignment. So sequence motif prediction is the end goal. There are of course repositories that contain known motifs so if we just want to know, hey, is motif X present in some protein that I just found, we can go look at the conserved motifs at any number of sites. And I've listed just a few here, Interpro, CDD, Conserved Domain Database. Some of these are integrated into search algorithms like BLAST already. If you run a BLAST search and it identifies a conserved motif or conserved domain on NCBI, it will show you that and allow you to click through and find more information about that domain and the pattern that encodes it. There are also uh, motifs for RNA, identified motifs for RNA. RFAM is probably the largest repository for RNA motifs. Okay, so what do we want to do? question we might ask is, I have a protein sequence, does it contain any motifs? All I have is my sequence at the moment. I have no other information about it. One approach we might take is build a profile, build a pattern, and then search the known universe. Of course, if we only have one protein sequence, we need more proteins, more sequences to actually build that pattern. Multiple sequence alignment requires multiple sequences. How do we do this? One popular way is to use a specific kind of BLAST called PSI-BLAST. It stands for Position Specific Iterated BLAST. This is available on the BLAST website. So you can go to BLAST, Choose the PSI-BLAST option and paste in your protein sequence. Here's what happens when you do that. Here's your protein sequence. We call it the query. What PSI-BLAST does is first it will run a normal BLAST P. And remember, this is a protein BLAST against whatever database you tell it to run it against. It runs a BLAST P and it creates a number of pairwise alignments as we've discussed in previous slides. From those pairwise alignments, it takes the top, however many, 25, 50, 100, and creates a multiple sequence alignment, uses that multiple sequence alignment to generate a frequency matrix, position specific frequency matrix. Just like we've done in the past two slide decks. It uses that position specific frequency matrix, which we call a profile, and runs another modified BLAST P, taking into account the information at each site of your query. If it finds additional sequences, above and beyond what it used to build the multiple sequence alignment, you have the option to iterate the process. And by that, I mean you can tell BLAST, PsiBLAST, to include the new sequences, build a new frequency matrix, new profile, and search using that profile. At some point, BLAST will stop finding new sequences, or you will get tired of iterating, and you can exit. It gives you a list of the final pairwise alignments that match your query. So for very conserved motifs like the hexapeptide 
that we've discussed and I'm showing here, this may or may not be very useful. These are really strong signals, lots of conservation, no need to go through lots of hoops to find them. But for finding more subtle motifs, where conservation might occur over a larger sequence, maybe more noise in those sequences, something like Cyblast is really useful for identifying those. It's good at finding distant orthologs, as we call them. Okay, there's distance. In other words, find the yeast orthologue in humans or find the E. coli orthologue in Rickettsia. Those are separated by evolutionary distance. So there's conservation of a sequence, but there's also a fair amount of noise as those sequences have diverged somewhat. Cyblast is fairly good at finding that subtle signal amongst increasing noise due to evolutionary distance. But another problem that we have in finding motifs is that sequence may not be conserved directly, but instead there's conservation at some other level of organization. So the simplest, most straightforward one to think about in terms of conservation is structure. Here I've depicted a helix turn helix structure. You can actually click on this link. It will take you to an interpro description of the helix turn helix. This is a very common structural motif in DNA binding proteins. Part of this helix turn helix motif sits inside usually the major groove of the DNA helix. Lots of transcription factors have these motifs. Things that bind to nucleic acid helices tend to use a motif like helix turn helix. The problem for us in trying to identify these is that conservation occurs at the structural level. It is the helix turn helix structure that's important for DNA binding and it's the amino acid residues particularly the ones exposed on the surface of those helices or the faces of those helices that determine the specificity of that protein. So different DNA binding proteins with different specificities will have different amino acid conservation patterns. But the structural motif, helix turn helix, is conserved at a different level. So here I've just colored some of the sequence conservation we might see. These are all transcription factors, related transcription factors. There's strong conservation at particular positions in this helix, turn helix motif. And those are generally the positions that occur on the DNA binding face, where the amino acid side chains contact the DNA sequence. Those are very specific. Outside of those particular positions, there's very little conservation of sequence. So how do we find these motifs? Searching for pure sequence conservation is generally going to fail us here. So one way we can do this is to use a more sophisticated search algorithm, still based on information content, still based on patterns, but using them at a more sophisticated level than something like a simple blast. So one of the more popular algorithms is called HAMMER. It's H-M-M-E-R, it's short for Hidden Markov Modeler. And if you click on Mario here, you will be taken to the HAMMER webpage. Hammer is a software program that allows you to paste in your protein sequence, your query sequence, and it builds a hidden Markov model. Uh, you probably remember us discussing hidden Markov models in a different context. This was in building phylogenetic trees, deciding, defining what the ancestral sequence is in an alignment. Here's another depiction of that. 
a little bit mathematical for us, but the essential take home from this is that there is a hidden state, that's the hidden in the Markov model, there's a hidden state that is the ancestral sequence. And we use the observed states or the outputs to infer what the ancestral state is. How does that work with a multiple sequence alignment and Hammer? Hammer uses something called a profile HMM. So it takes your protein sequence, it runs a multiple sequence alignment on related sequences, derives a protein or a position specific frequency matrix and uses that to build a hidden Markov model. And it looks something like this. I've simplified this uh, just to get the point across. But essentially there is a start state, you can think of these as states, these boxes here. There's a start state, there's a match one, two, three, four. We have four positions in our minor, small, multiple sequence alignment. You can assign a probability here determined by the frequency matrix that's calculated off of the multiple sequence alignment. So for example, the probability of finding an L here is one and everything else is zero probability of finding an E here is 0.5 and a D is 0.5 and everything else is zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Keep, again, keep in mind, this is a very simple multiple sequence alignment. They tend to be much more complicated probability matrices here. Okay, you can add to that profile HMM states that represent insertions. So you can calculate a probability, again, based on the multiple sequence alignment, that there is an insertion here. For example, if 50% of your sequences have an insertion, this insertion might have a probability of 0.5. Okay, often we see a probability that there is an insertion and then a different probability that the insertion is flexible. One, two, three amino acids in that insertion positions, I should say. Okay, so you can add probabilities for insertion states. You can do the same thing for deletion states. The final part of this puzzle, and arguably makes a profile HMM so powerful, is the concept of transitions. So you can calculate a transition probability, a probability that when you have a particular position, when you have a particular residue in a position, the probability that that residue transitions to another residue. So for example, if you have a if you have a glycine, if you have a G here, what is the probability that that G is followed by a P, or followed by an A, or followed by an L? This extends our hidden Markov model to take into account previous states, previous information. And in fact, we don't need to be limited to just the step before. We can calculate transition probabilities using any number of states. Of course, that makes the hidden Markov model more complicated, which means it takes more compute power to run. And so there's a trade-off between the information we can glean and the length of the hidden Markov model that we build, the number of transition states that we use. But this combination of probabilities, matches, insertions, deletions, and transitions, allow us to model things like structural conservation. Okay, we're gonna end our discussion of motif searching, motif matching here. Thank you. <laughs>